I was raised in a middle class family, working middle class family. My mother taught us, particularly my sister and I, uh, the sister next to me and I, that uh, we we're African. All right. Uh, she made that a very important lesson for us. She said, you are African, you know, nobody call you nothing other than that, okay? So, and she brought us the culture, you know, she, she made us understand that. But at that time, as a young woman, she was involved in, uh, uh, African dance class and that kind of thing. So me growing up, I always knew that I was an African child, okay, a child of, of Africa, and therefore being called outside of my name, you know, the N word, and I don't like using the word. I don't like the word at all, and they use it crazy around these places these days. But being called that was uh, those fighting words. You know, in our house, we used to have pictures of Black Brown. You know, Stokely Carmichael, Malcolm X. You know, so these individuals, these these were icons, you know, in, in the household, you know, represent, you know what I mean? Represent this movement, right? So you know, Martin and the whole bit. I'm tired of violence. I've seen too much of it. I've seen hate on the faces of too many sheriffs in the South. And I'm not gonna let my oppressor dictate to me what method I must use. The, the, the assassination of Martin Luther King, that's one thing that impacts me. The, the other thing that really impacted me, uh, I think it was 1968 Olympics, when John Carlos and uh, Tommy Smith raised their fists and protests, that was significant. John Carlos used to be one of my math tutors. So the culture, the African culture and, and the politics and the, the, the time, you know, the struggle that was going on, the civil rights movement that was going on at that time, you know, being a, being a part of that and being impressed by that. Um, and then, the other hand, seeing the Black Panther Party taking this other stroke after the death of Martin Luther King, after his assassination, I began to realize that maybe this nonviolent protest thing is not going to be all this is going to be in order to make real changes in this country. You are either free or you are a slave. There's no such thing as second class citizenship. The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. We don't hate nobody because of their color. We hate oppression. We hate murder of black people in our communities. We hate the gross unemployment that exists in our communities. We hate black men being taken off into the military service to be fighting for our greatest decadent American prominence as freedom. Well, I saw Black Panther Party on TV, and I told my mom, right there. I said, Mom, I'm going to be one of them. I'm going to be a part of that. And she had a fit. She says, Zoom. People there, they ain't know what they're doing, so forth and so on. But I said, Mom, they fight for black people. She said, Ah, they ain't, you know, she's on some other thing, you know, nonviolence, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, so she didn't, she didn't support that idea, but they had an impression upon me. And, uh, you know, during the summer, I used to come down, I used to always come over to the office, help out with distribution of the paper or certain kind of things that need to be done around the office, you know, hanging out during the summer with the homies. But they want to get us off the streets. Why? Because J. Hoover says that the Black Panther Party is the greatest national security threat of the United States. And um, when the party split, a lot of people were sent to the underground, underground movement, right? And uh, essentially I was recruited into the underground. 
efforts to struggle, you know, uh, on that level has been since, you know, the day we came out off the boats. They brought us off the boats. We've always been in rebellion, you know, from the, from the slave rebellions, uh, uh, from plantations to the um, rebellions of Nat Turner, Denmark Vesse, Gabriel Proster, to the um, Revolutionary Action Movement, uh, and then naturally to the BPP and the BLA. You know, so there's always been that historical thread of resistance against white supremacy and racism. And, uh, and when you recognize that, that, that thread of resistance um, throughout history, then you can see that there's always been that <clears throat> a movement, okay, no matter what name it took and time and place, right, there's always been those individuals who milit pers pers militantly pursue the ideals of freedom and liberation. The case of the New York Three, it originally was New York Five, okay? Uh, originally it was uh, two uh, Borequan brothers, Francisco Torres and Gabriel Torres. In May 19, 1971, uh, two um, police officers were wounded, okay? Uh, May 21st, 1971, two police officers were killed. Daruba bin Wahab in June was captured uh, for the May 19th event, okay? And come to find out 19 years later that he did not commit that, okay? August 28th, 1971, Noah and myself was captured in San Francisco and subsequently charged with the New York May 21st killing. The first trial was two trials. The first trial ended in a hung jury for the New York Five. All right. Um, the second trial, from which uh, when the jurors were to receive the case to deliberate, or a decision made uh, by the, the defense, the prosecutor and the judge, to dismiss the charges for Francisco and Gabriel Torres. Noah, myself, and Herman were convicted. When, when a judge sentenced us, you know, he says that if these men are prisoners of war, then they have to recognize they're being captured by the enemy and they can expect what they're going to expect. That's the judge's sentencing statement. Yeah. He essentially said that we're prisoners of war. J. Edgar Hoover today characterized the Black Panthers as the most dangerous and violence prone of all the extremist groups now active in the United States. They know what happened with this case. They know what happened. Now that we've been convicted of this, now we have to prove our innocence. We're victims of COINTELPRO. All right? So while the United States has determined that the activities during that period of time um, where the Black Panther Party was a target of COINTELPRO and determined that the activities of the FBI was illegal and unconstitutional at that time, they have not established no remedies Right, they have established no redress for those who were victimized. All right, so now that's unfinished business. So I put out a call, basically a flyer, right, making a call for uh, Jericho 1998. And um, it was enthusiastically supported, uh, both inside and outside of prisons across the country. One of the reasons why we use the term Jericho because it's biblical. You know, it comes from uh, uh, the story of Joshua, you know, and when he surrounded the city of Jericho and the people marched and raised a clamor, you know, and the blowing of the trumpets to issue the, a new day, a new time, and the walls of Jericho came falling down. And, and basically what that means is that we are raising the noise, raising the clamor, the issues of human rights, until the wall of neglect and the lies of this not existing, you know, is torn down. So everybody will see, hey, 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 political push does exist in the United States. You know, every nation, every government, you know, has individuals who are quote-unquote dissidents and have been incarcerated because of their political beliefs 
or their activities in regards to political, you know, political work, so forth and so on. So how can the United States, you know, deny, you know, that they have dissidents? Of course the United States have dissidents. Uh, we continue to argue that the United States is an issue of human rights. You know, it's not a civil matter. And it comes out to fold of civil matters. It's, it's an international issue. You know, it's an issue that affects all peoples everywhere. Now, if we're going to look at the United States as being uh, a representative of the international police, right, that it governs in, in terms of its empire, in terms of what goes on and determines what are human rights in other parts of the world, right, particularly in terms of dissidents in other parts of the world, and argues that those issues are human rights issues in other parts of the world, how can you deny that same validating matter or issue here in the United States within its own borders? If you do, there will be hypocrisy, the height of hypocrisy. All right? And we already know that, right? All right? Didn't Malcolm say <laughs> that, <laughs> that democracy is nothing but, but playing uh, hypocrisy? But the, the reality of the situation is that the, the system is, is, is manipulated is manipulated terribly by money interests. The rich rules, the rich controls, the mechanisms of government. And the majority of the public suffers. They have found a new way to make money, a new way to make money of poor black and brown people, right? So they take away the steel mills, take away the major industries, and then they create prisons. The bodies have become commodities in the system, okay? So now, my number, 778-4283, you can basically say that's a barcode, you know what I mean? And that cell is like, you know, they're trying to figure out, well, how much uh, shelf life I have for this particular product, this particular commodity in this particular cell, so how much money I can make from this individual, all right? So now we're counting heads as if there are cans on a shelf, you know, in this industry, this prison industrial complex. And then, so if you have a industry that feeds off people's lives, you have to figure out some kind of way to make sure that the industry continues to expand and grow. And how do they do that? They change the laws to make the laws much more repressive so that more people go to prisons for less violations of the law and stay in prison for longer periods of time. When they brought me in December 5th, 1972, when they brought me from California to, to New York, they put me in Old Queens and they put me in a a, um, a tier with uh, two other noted quote unquote national revolutionaries. Uh, one by the name of Rap Brown and the other one by the name of Max Sanford. And I used to watch these guys uh, make their prayers five times a day. And I could not understand it. It was uh, something that was say, you know, Listen, you guys are national leaders. You guys are recognized, you know, as part of this, you know, put this movement on the map, you know. And what you guys doing, you know, praying to some God? You know, we got to get busy, man. We got to go to work, man. You know, because praying ain't going to make us free. And uh, <clears throat> so I argued, I argued, I argued for about six months about this whole idea of, because I, at that time, I believed myself to be a Marxist Leninist. You know, that's why politics comes from the party. You know, Malcolm X, Mao Zedong thought, you know, Malcolm X, you know, that was my ideals, okay? And that's what I was based my principles on, you know? So anything other than uh, deal with the material reality of which we're dealing with, uh, I wasn't trying to hear it. What happened was that during the course of our arguing and debating and, you know, me being uh, bullheaded, you know, in my own right, you know, uh, there's one thing I could not, uh, I don't know how you say this, uh, refute, right, was the question of what happens to energy after you die. 
So, be a materialist, <laughs> understanding this thing, and recognize that hey, it might be a possibility, okay, because I don't have all the answers, then, it's, you know, maybe I should uh, take my shahada, you know, and uh, look forward to something better than, or hopefully something better than uh, this existence. At the same time, continue to work to improve uh, the conditions in which we live in today, you know, and try to be a better person. So, being a Muslim doesn't take away from being a revolutionary. You know, as, as I walk in the prison yards and look at the sea of faces, and the only thing I see, the majority of what I see is black and brown faces. I have to question what the hell is going on, okay? You have to question to the extent of this. If there are 250 million people in this country, black and brown people that at most comprise no more than 50 million, right? However, we comprise 58 to 80 percent of the prison population. Are you telling me that only black and brown people are committing crime in this country? And if so, right, although I don't believe that's true, but if and if it is true, then we have to ask another question, why? There's something wrong with the unequal distribution of wealth then. So now we have either one or two problems, or probably both. Unequal distribution of wealth, that poor people have to commit crime, that poverty is impetus towards crime, right? So we're not addressing the issues of poverty, one. Or two, institutional racism has created a, a dynamic or mechanism to put poor or black people, people of color, in prison. Now, is it one or the other or the combination of both? I think it's a combination of both. PPs and POWs need to be able to speak in their own voice. They're not being heard, okay? Put a face and a voice to the movement. Let them tell their own stories. Because I think they have some powerful stories to tell. And I think if we're able to do that and, and put that forth, bring that out to the public, people will recognize, hey, they are real people, you know. And yes, we need them out. You see what I'm saying? They have something to contribute to society at large. They're not, quote unquote, the common criminal. You see? So uh, people got to know that that the PPs and POWs are the kind of person that you want to live next door, you know, that you want in, to be in your community. And the only way that that can happen is that we have to uh, put a face on them. We got to get our own voice out there. People are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. So now if you're able to organize people to respond to particular ideas, goals and objectives, that's your greatest bargaining chip, people. If you know how to uh, make people to come together uh, and understand the power of an idea, uh, the question of, for instance, the idea of freedom and liberation, you know, uh, it's very powerful. It scares a lot of people. When you get a lot of people start talking about freedom and liberation as an idea, it scares a lot of people who, who, are, who are in power. And so by offering new ideas and getting people to start thinking, and with new ideas, the greater possibility that then they will therefore act.